so people are interested in a lot of different things when they talk about artificial intelligence. I think probably the most common image people have is they imagine a kind of an, an analogy to a human. So they imagine something like you see in a science fiction movie of a robot that has an intelligent, uh, has a mind just like a human has a mind and has motivations like a human has motivations. And I think that's a very interesting thing to study. I, I don't think it's the thing I'm most interested in. Um, the thing that I'm most interested in is how can we create intelligences that work with human intelligences so that our, our extended intelligence is much smarter. So, so basically something that thinks in a complementary way to the way that we think and in hopefully a better way. And in fact, an awful lot of the thinking we do, we don't do in an individual brain. We do as groups of people, we do as collaborations, and so on. And we already do it as collaborations with machines, but so far the machines are mostly pretty simple doing statistical analysis. And so I'm interested in what is the potential, particularly um, in, in, in this context of how AI will help us in medicine, of creating a kind of complementary intelligence to human intelligence. And one of the things that we've begun to realize is that intelligence is a lot of different things, but there's, there's sort of two broad categories of, of intelligence, which we're discovering this in cognitive psychology, we're discovering this in AI, we're discovering this over and over again. And one of them is a kind of a fast thinking. Um, in fact, actually, uh, Danny Kahneman just wrote a book called Think Fast, Think Slow, sort of rediscovering this in the area of behavioral economics. But it's something that's been discovered many times in, in, in other areas. But I think his, his think fast, think slow is a good way of describing it. So the fast thinking is the kind of thinking we do when we recognize a face. It seems effortless. It's almost instantaneous. Um, it clearly only happens with a few levels of processing of neurons because we know it takes milliseconds for a neuron to fire. And it can happen so quickly that there's only time for about 30 levels of of calculation in there. And, and so it's a flash decision. It's often inaccurate. It might see a school bus as an ostrich. Um, it's a sort of statistical, uh, it's a st statistical way of thinking, but it's an incredibly efficient way of thinking. And in fact, it is literally kind of like statistics in the sense that really what we do in statistics is we look for simple things that we can add up. And we, we try to transform big data sets into, way, into numbers so that those things add up into, into nice piles. So all these drawings that you've seen, for example, in the last section, the maps of um, microbiomes, those were easy to visualize because a computer had remapped that complicated data sort of into a space in which we do a very simple flash, easy, fast thinking separation. And that's essentially what most of statistics is about. And it's actually most of what machine learning is about. If you hear about deep learning, deep neural networks, it's effectively automated ways of doing something a lot like what a statistician does, which is look for ways of remapping the data, finding intermediate ways of aggregating the data so that it has features, so that that kind of fast separation thinking can work on it. It's a little bit like the kind of what we do when we visualize data. We find a good way of visualizing the data that shows the three different clusters or something like that. In effect, we have ways of machine learning where one layer of the network sort of pre-visualizes the data for the next layer of the network. And maybe we have a couple of steps of that where each layer kind of learns a way of making the problem a little easier for the next layer. And an awful lot of the developments that, do, that you've seen in AI of things like how it's gotten much better at speech recognition or face recognition, things like that, you use these kind of statistical techniques, these sort of fast, fast thinking techniques, these connectionist learning techniques. And in fact, in some sense, we're already very much augmenting our intelligence when we use computers to do big data analysis and so on. So, a lot of the work that you saw presented this morning was using computers to do that level of interpretation 
to translate the data into something that we could do fast, fast thinking on. Now there's also a completely different kind of thinking that we do, which is the slow thinking. And the slow thinking is the kind of thinking we do when we tell a story. We try to break things up into a chain of causes and effects. And it has certain characters and they play certain roles in it. And that's kind of, a, and, and so that's the kind of thinking we do, for instance, if you see a, a pathway published in nature that says this causes that. It's kind of a little story about how this thing works. And uh, one, a chain of reasoning, if you will. And it takes a lot longer to think about stories like that, to explain them, to sort of reason through the consequences of it. But they're able to do a different kind of, of reasoning. I remember for, for a long time, I just, I just recently, last week I was in Singapore and I visited Sidney Brenner. And for a long time, any time I read about a gene in the literature or something like that, I could just call up Sidney Brenner and say, hey, J Sidney, tell me about this gene. And he would tell me a story. He would tell me, well, it's thought to cause this, it's regulated by that, the people that did the experiment didn't actually do such a great job of proving this. And he would have like a whole series of stories around the gene that linked it to all these other genes. And there was a time when there were sort of few enough genes understood that, I mean, Sydney's can still pretty much do that, but not very many people in the world can, can do that. And we're rapidly running out of the time when, um, you know, anybody can tell you that about all biological knowledge of sort of the stories that link it and the reasoning that link it and so on. So it doesn't really do much good for us if, if we had the magical statistical technique that, for instance, could generate all the pathways in a cell. You know, is that something that we could even hold in our head? I mean, almost certainly not because we're designed to understand stories of a certain complexity. Probably most of our story cause and effect mind is about reasoning about other people. We're social animals. It's probably about, you know, this person did that because this, and, and we sort of take that reasoning and we apply it to, to scientific systems. We have very limited capacity to do that. I think one of the most interesting things to me in artificial intelligence is that in principle, we ought to be able to build machines that understand much more complex stories. So the, the sort of super Sidney Brenner that has the, the capacity to actually read all those million papers a year and can actually say the sensible reasoning story about it. And I think those two kinds of machines together is actually what would create an intelligence that would be very helpful for us. So, so uh, for instance, you just saw um, the example of humans um, being beat in Go for the first time, uh, champion level humans. The way that that program worked is it actually had two different kinds of parts to it. One part was a neural network that did this kind of multi-layer deep network pattern recognition, where it did the equivalent of what a human Go player does almost like intuition, visualization, you recognize that's a weak position. There's a barrier. You know, that's an opportunity for attack. Those are things that a human almost sees, a, a, a master globe player almost just perceives those. They can't even say why they see that. That just looks like a weak position. And so there was a neural network in that machine that did that. But then there was also something that was much more like a storyteller that reasoned about the future that said, well, if I do this, then the opponent will do that. And then I could do that. And so sort of thinks through that sort of slow, logical reasoning and did some planning in that. And it was the combination of those two things that, in fact, mastered, mastered Go. And I think what's going to happen in using AI in biology is we're going to have to combine those two kinds of things. And I think mostly we've been concentrating on the first thing. We've been mostly looking for kind of data mining, helping us with the statistics kind of thing. But I think we're going to have another generation where we get these kind of master storytellers. Um, and you know, hopefully they will help us reason about these things that are literally too complicated for us unaided humans to understand. Thank you.